<laughs> All right. Okay. Good evening, guys. Um, welcome to the meetup. Um, tonight I'm going to give a talk. Um, pretty much. Um, you can skip the title of it. Um, just like the post that uh, this is the introduction to uh Elixir modules. Um, um, the more I prepare it, the more I think it is rather than me try to uh, practice more uh, public public speaking other than giving a like, technical talk. So you have to bear with me. Um, so a quick uh, I could also myself. Uh, my name is Wei. I have been a long time Rubyist, like a bit more than 10 years now. Um, I'm also getting involved a little bit on the engineering and op stuff. And recent years, I have been uh, interested in uh, functional programming and, and, and Elixir. And about this talk, um, yes, um, because uh, then, then I started to get into Elixir, um, I did some like experience uh, projects in, in my company. And then um, I did around uh, almost uh, 10 months uh, to time Elixir role. And, and then I'm thinking, um, when I come back to this uh, project that I've done in my earlier uh, Elixir, uh, Elixir uh, learning uh, path, then I'm thinking, um, what will I do if I'm going to do the task again? So during the process, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is probably a good um good topic to um share with uh, some of the uh, beginners, uh, so that they get a uh, more understanding about uh about uh, the Edison project. And the reason I choose this is um it is a, a relatively uh, simple task, but with uh, real world requirements. So I would think I, I would think that that would make a good example. So um so just a, just a little bit of uh disclaimer. So um so I I'm by no means I'm not a editor, so um I'm still learning in progress. So some of the solution or code uh, might not be the best practices. So just bear that in mind. Also, some of the um start or proof of concept I did in this demo. Um, not all of them has been verified in the production environment. Um, some of them are. Uh, so just uh, if you have any feedback or a better approach, um, feel free to shoot me. So I'm going to give a little bit of uh, project background. So it is a simple CSV uh, imported from external source. So the third party data source is update every line. Um, so that means um, we will need a cron job to kick things off. And we have more than like 50 CSV types with different schemas and different sizes. So that means uh, we will have different job types that match to different um, echo schema. Um, and then eventually um, the data will be dumped to the database uh, for BI purposes. So that means we will have a downstream target for our project. So unfortunately, um, the CSV team, uh, schema change occasionally, like or say randomly, like sometimes three months, sometimes six months. They they have to do just add one or two columns. That that means um, things will break. And finally, um, because um, this is sort of a, a side surface, a side project, not side project, like um, a, a small support surfaces, and we have our main app to the ideal to have a dashboard that um, somehow integrate into the main app. So that would mean that we will need to have a web services for this uh, small uh, application. So um, when come to the decision which steps to choose, um, because I'm from Ruby background, so um, naturally I would compare the both. So uh, I would say um, it works fine with other languages, but uh, because the nature of this project say um, we will need to have a multiple input uh, for different uh, job types. That means we will need to have um, uh, some sort of background job system, uh, like psychic or active jobs. And also, um, uh, we because we need to provide a dashboard, that also means we need to have some sort of a web interface, like Arrows or Sinatra, whatever web framework you decide to choose. And that also come with the potential dependencies, not Redis, if you want to run the, run the background jobs. So um, just given the 
uh, small nature of these services, um, I think it's a bit more uh, too much overhead to introduce all those um, like, uh, components or, 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 or dependencies for this one. So um, also um, in the past to learn Elixir back then. So um, uh, if the Elixir, the, the advantage is um, it is very flexible. So by itself, you can contain um, because it's so easy to spin up new services. So you can have like job, job application and you can have web server and also you have like some like similar functionality of Redis. Everything in one place. So, so that that's why I choose to try to run it in this simple project. So, um, so um, this demo will be showing a simple drop processes. Um, some of the dummy, uh, just uh, I'm not going to show you a CS3 in person, uh, but just uh, some dummy code to demonstrate some of the basic uh, modules of Elixir so that uh, uh, we can uh, show to the if anyone uh, new to Elixir, is, I think it's a good, good uh, starting point. So, um, so now we are going to uh, see the demo. Uh, we will have something very simple to begin with. So, let me. Uh, oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, do you guys see the editor? Yep. All right. So um, let's start with the beginning. So let's check our first one. <laughs> so um, we have two modules here. Um, um, to get rid of all the complexity, uh, we start with everything in pure function. Um, so we have a job module, uh, which uh, is the meat of the application, like what it does. So uh, we also have uh, three jobs like type A, B, C. I'm just trying to simulate. Uh, we have different types of CSV to import. And we have a job run function, um, which calls the individual job dot run. Uh, for this case, I will uh, use a slip to simulate um, the job is running. So um, I also put the different times. So I would say um, job A will take one second to finish and same. And, and two seconds go for B and three seconds go to C. And if you can't see here on this line five, it pretty much just simulate. If I put an environment variable in enable error, and that if I put that, then when job B run, it will crash my reason exception just to simulate things so bad. And on the left, I have the our job manager. So this is pretty simple. Um, we have a job list, which is a list of job types. And then we do a loop, and then each of them, I just do the, do the run function on that. So um, without further ado, let's try. Um, so we start the so. server. So um, because Different jobs take different time to finish. So you can see um, from the start to finish, it takes a total of six seconds to finish. And the things because we're doing for, uh, as a loop. So I think we do it sequentially. So let's do it with um, set up being able error to false and try the application again. So if they do this again, um, not surprisingly, because everything is in order. So when it started, we only finish the job A, and then when we start the job B, boom, and then boom, crash, a uh, B crash, and we never got a chance to run job C. So um, what the issue about this approach is like, um, for most of the time, uh, when we have a list of items need to do, uh, need to do uh, stuff, that we usually just do a loop. And that the issue of that is a uh, substantial uh, task takes time, say, Say for example, you will see um, it will add up to 
like six seconds to finish all the whole time. Um, in real life, uh, in my case, if I do it in the sequential approach for my CSV importer, that would take probably an hour to finish up everything. everything. Um, the other thing is uh, the also, uh, it is also a waste of resources because most of the time, um, the web servers are providing more CPUs nowadays. And if you do things uh, sequentially, that means you are uh, wasting money on your infrastructure. So that is one thing. Uh, the other thing, as you can see, um, in a loop, if some unexpected uh, error happens, that actually will stop the rest of the uh, rest of the loop. That would be a problem because, like, you might miss the, the data. In that case, so um, so that's when I come to the next uh, Elixir module, which is task. Um, this is some definition copied from the official document. But to be honest, uh, my own understanding of task is just a wrapper that uh, from the processes to do uh, extra, extra calculations. Um, the, the line for here is pretty um, expressive. Like um, the main usage of it is um, try to put to convert a sequential code into a concurrent code. Um, the most simple usage is two method is start and async. Um, the difference is, is the start is it does not require the return value. While async, um, it will wait. Uh, it will wait at some point that um, the task result to come back and then make use of it. So if I can just so. For this one, literally, you can see it just one line of change code. So before that, we have a job dot run. Now we put it inside an anonymous function within the task of start. So if I oh, if I run this one, so you can see right away it's saying three jobs started, and then um, the job finished. Uh, I'm not saying in order, but you can see the job starting at 02 and then it finished at 05. That means um, this job actually finished the first seconds after the job starts. And then we take at most only three seconds to finish everything. So that is a big improvement. So the same, the, uh, the same thing we can test on the, um, the back path. So if I run the job, So, um, wait. Okay, so we have a look here. Um, so we start the three job uh, at the same time, pretty much. And then, boom, um, job B got crashed as expected. But um, you can see uh, actually job A and job C, it actually is finished. So that means um, the crash of job B will affect the execution of both A and C. Uh, because using tasks, we can spawn the different processes for different, uh, for different uh, functions. So that is one improvement that you can make use of tasks. But um, sometimes um, you do need to uh, uh, just drop the, the task to return value because uh, sometimes just uh, you need to update the state of the uh, your execution. So that in that case, uh, we will need something else. Um, that's where we come to uh, the gen server. Um, I give some time for you guys to have a look on this uh, official like, documentation, but in my own understanding is gen server is the most common uh, implementation of Erlang's um, OTP's uh, actor model. Um, so we use gen server to spin up um, services because um, Elixir is a functional programming. So at some point, um, you need something to handle the state. So pretty much gen server is the go-to uh, uh, state process handler. For, for this uh, uh, 
actor model approach, and they exchange, they, they communicate with each other by sending messages. So uh, let's go to the next demo. So some things have been changed. So at this point, before is everything is a pure function, but now you can see uh, I turn the job manager into gen server. Um, if if you don't understand, you probably just um you can skip this um like the initial function. Um, so what you need to understand is um, uh, we have a public method to do jobs, and then when it's called, and then it's passing to an internal process, and and then we do the uh, we also do the loop here. So we I do the test uh, test task. So pretty much the same. So I have a list of jobs, and then um, I we change the task to task with uh, task async and to do the job. And then at the end, I will wait, wait the task to finish. Here, uh, because we are using gen server, that means we can save, save the state of the process. Um, uh, we make a very simple uh, use case here, say uh, after the task is finished, and then I will use uh, reduce to uh, aggregate the job result. Say, uh, if the result is okay, I would put to the state and this job, um, it is finished now, right? So, so it's very simple. So here, the change is um, instead of uh, just run and forget about it, I put a last uh, return value for OK to make to, so that I can come back here to play the match saying um, the job is finished um, and then I have a timestamp of the time of the finish, uh, the task finish day. So we can have a look. So uh, from the look of it, it will be the same as using task itself. But if you um, try to get the state of the job manager, because it's a server, we can uh, query the state of the gen server. So I have a state of the state of the uh, 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 gen server indicating um, this is time that the finish finish time of the last task run. And if you going if you go to the error path. We have something interesting. Uh, okay, but one thing I want to uh, mention is um, uh, for the demo purpose, I output output the process ID after we start the server. So you can see when the messages started, I have a, a process ID of job manager of like two or eight. So then I run the job, uh, job B crashes. And that actually also crashes the job manager as well. As you can see now, we have a new process ID here. So that is not very ideal. Um, um, in this case, it doesn't really uh, return any successful uh, task, even though only job D fail, because uh, maybe in, in this demo, I use a, way, a task away many. So when job D fail, um, it raises exception to actually crash this job away many. So this is that that probably is mixing to us. So then we have to then 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 um we can fix it by simply like try to catch everything here. So in, in that case, um say that I want to catch the error and then return something else. Now we have a sort of a ideal process uh, result that we start everything. Um, you can you can actually notice that the job run it is not actually in, in order. So we have the job B fail, but now the job A and job C actually finish. And more uh, more importantly, uh, now the job manager itself doesn't get restarted. So because once you start, you have a new new PID here, the process ID here. But um. So that raises another issue. 
um, more often that uh, we have many process running in, in, in some applications, like, uh, for example, we have many job types. Um, although we try to reskill, um, like, like we like in the demo, like, but um, the bottom line is if one process dies and it should not affect others, and let alone that you actually crash the parent process, in this case, uh, job manager. Um, process should be isolated when crashed and then should be start taking with the uh, good state. So this is where we come to another important module of Alexa, which is called supervisor. Um, as you can imagine the name, supervisor supervise other processes. Um, and also supervisor can form what we call supervision chief and have some sort of a hierarchy process structure. And supervisor can monitor um, gen server and supervisor can also monitor another supervisor. So in this case, um, it provides for current um, encapsulation, how application uh, start and shut down. Let's have a look on the current diagram here. So we have the top um, application, uh, top level is application, and then um, it spin up a link process for job manager, which which this is a, a, a round square icon. Uh, this is mean this uh, for this is mean gen server, um, and then it will spin up different job ABC task task. Um, in this square, it means this task, and it only lives during the period that the function gets executed. After this is born, finished, I mean, I, and then it will terminate and return the value to, to the to the caller. So the problem is um, for this one, if drop D crashes, it actually somehow bring down the manager job manager itself, which is not a um, ideal situation. So what we're going to do. Um, is to introduce a supervisor. So um, this is um, what we can do. So instead of running the task of different job types directly, then we can have something in the middle with called supervisor. Um, and then supervisor itself monitor the different job types. In this case, um, job ABC will change from a simple task and it will become a giant server itself. Uh, so that when this crashes, um, supervisor can start the server um, if needed. All right, so at the top level, now we have two um, servers starting. The first one is just a job manager itself. The other one is what we call a dynamic supervisor. Um, has some complication. So we have strategy one-on-one -on -one, as we show on the previous diagram, and then we put a name for it. And then um, not much change in this one. Instead of, uh, uh, except that we get rid of tasks, so um, when the job manager starts um, in the handle up, handle continue after init, uh, actually uh, start to spin up all these job supervisors. So if I can. So for each job, we do a loop for the job types the same stop ties and then we loop each one and then we start a uh, try process with the uh, job runner is the dynamic supervisor. Uh, we, and then we have a very simple job supervisor and passing the job types here. So that means uh, when the application starts, the, uh, the supervisor already spin up and also supervision supervise the, 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 jobs, the job types. So if I have a look on the right hand side, so the job itself become a gen server itself, uh, gen server, and we have the uh, standard gen server functions to receive uh, communication from outside world. Um, in this case, I will 
I, I can, we can also put state into the job survey itself because the job itself now is server. So we can have the say the last done information into the from from the uh, this, this information uh, we we push from the gen, uh, jobs manager itself to the jobs level. So we have a very simple uh, supervisor here. So pretty much just uh, that means uh, we, we we spin up the jobs for it. And then when the job after the uh, server spin up and when it receives uh, two functions, uh, two, two, two uh, jobs. So it will send message to the jobs, to the job, uh, job server here. Yeah. So let's demo. So see, I haven't triggered any jobs, but you can see in the, in the console, you can see uh, first I started the job manager. And then right after I was starting the supervisor for job server A, B, and C. And this is where, this is the actual um, server process ID for job A, job B, and job C. So they are ready to receive message. So when I do job manager two jobs, uh, two jobs, and if we do a loop, and now the the two job we change to, I will cast the job, which is the processor, and send the run command to it, so run message to it, which eventually, uh, which, which will be picked up by here, and the cast. So the job will receive message run and then start the processing. So um, from here, uh, Output of it, it, it looks the same as previous one, but the whole architecture is changed now. So you can have a look on the state of the manager. Um, this is mean, um, okay, I think, I think it's, it means uh, you spin up the uh, supervisor. Uh, I think it's spin up the supervisor correctly. And other than that, you can also get the state of individual job servers. So we have job C, job A, right? That means job itself become a server. Then we can um, save it, save on it. And then we pick other error path. Oh. So it's the same, we spin up the supervisor right away. And then we do the jobs. So right after you can see job A and C finish, but because job C crashes and job C was spin up right away. So it has a different PID here. So job B is to one point, but now it's 220. So in this case, like only job B got restarted and job A and C doesn't affect it. More importantly, um, the job manager cell doesn't crash. Uh, it doesn't affect it by um, the crash of the job B. So that is a uh, uh, improvement. Well, well, I'm happy on this approach. Everything went fine until something else happened. Um, a big tenant has very large CSVs in both sizes and quality. And then uh, because um, this approach is triggered by corn job every midnight, that means uh, we spin up everything, uh, all, all the CS import at pretty much exact, exact, exactly the same time. Uh, and then we hit, a, uh, hit another issue, uh, hit by DB error, uh, because we spawn so many um, processes that uh, actually trusted the DB connections. So that, that, that is the new issue that we need to handle. So let's revis uh, revisit the workload. So as starters, uh, we do things in the loop. That means everything is potentially. Um, the the con side is is taking too long and waste of uh, infrastructure and resources, and we try to switch to task or gen server. Um, then we can implement the concurrent running 
for this project. The thing is, um, this is uh, concurrent without any control. And because once you execute uh, to do to, to do the command, and then in, in, in real life, I have like 50 CSV with different sizes um, from like 10 megabytes to the, this, this new tenant is like have like 700, 700 megabytes CSV that actually crash the system, uh, database connection. So um, then we need a new solution for this one. So uh, when we re rethink this approach, um, so what we are doing, so we are importing CSV. That means we actually read from some sort, some sort of source, um, like either you need to, either you read from a file or you actually read from a API, it doesn't matter, right? So, so you have a, you have a, a data to read from the source and then you insert into the database. That means it actually split into two parts. So for upstream, you would have the data fetching and then the downstream, you have the actual data processing. So that is something that, um, which uh, fit into another category of the uh, uh, toolbox. Oh, I have another one. Okay. So that means uh, for this approach, we can have a multiple uh, workflow into multiple, potentially multiple stages that we can have control. So that is coming to uh, what gen stage can provide us. So um, this is the, some sort of uh, multiple stage workflow that provided by the uh, Arabic gen stage. Um, so um, more often we have uh, many steps for a certain workflow. Um, for, for beginner, we will have the producer and, and then we have the consumer that receive data to receive data uh, and then process it. But for multiple for multiple um, uh, stages, the middle the middle stage can be both producer and consumer at the same time. And also, um, gen stage is very famous for its uh, back pressure mechanism. So the consumer it is sending demand upstream, and then only then um, producer we admit items. So. If you're thinking of normally, like I have um, a data flow and I, for producer, say um, I have a file, uh, I read a CSV file and then read the rows and then put it to some sort of, uh, say, for example, um, data cleaner. And then I put it to the consumer, the last consumer, say, um, a, a database importer. This is what I think, and what we should, we should think this is a normal uh, data flow means. But, in gen stage, actually, the uh, the trigger mechanism is a bit different. So it is actually for the consumer in this case, um, a database importer. When it finished the last process, it will ask more data from its upstream uh, stage. In this case, in this case, um, say like when the if we, we do the database insert in like patches, I mean, I finish this patch and give me more, and then. The producer will provide more more data to the to the to the to the consumer. Well, in this in this, in this case, that means um, we have control of the the later stage and then all the way back to the beginner, uh, the producer, so that we have some sort of a flow control. Other than uh, we produce millions of data at the beginning and then uh, and then it has no or no control of the downstream workflow that eventually uh, have very, very huge problem. So um, let's do some stuff. Um, so we have a we could split the kernel workflow into different uh, stages. Say we have a, a producer, and then we probably can sending rows from CSV, and then we have a consumer that uh, import data into DB. Um, for most uh, simple cases, uh, uh, this is fine. But for my particular issue is our data source is passive. It is um, triggered by cron job. So naturally, okay, when the cron job execute, I will produce a lot of things into producer. And then in, in, this, in this case, I lost control of the back pressure um, uh, mechanism. So eventually, that's right. In the beginning, I, I'm thinking of, I need to put something between the 
CSV reader and also the producer emitting data. So the first thing come to my mind is Pluxum. If you ask me now why I choose Pluxum, I can only confess that I haven't read the documentation carefully enough because it actually provides a solution already. Um, but anyway, um, also we have a Pluxum implement in my uh, in the other 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 application. So I'm thinking maybe it's a good example to make use of it. So let's try. So this is sort of a simple workflow uh, work uh, to demonstrate the, the, the fabrication. So we have the file, we have the file manager, and let's be on the supervisor, and then eventually spin up a supervise the job server. Um, when the system starts, and we have the gen state spin up as well. So we have the gen, uh, consumer, which is a database importer, the subscribe to the producer and the producer subscribe to the person. Um, when the job actually uh, reading file from external source, my like CS rows, and then it emits rows to the box up because uh, a uh, producer uh, subscribe to the box up, you push data to the box up. Um, now I think I have the wrong drawing here. So the producer actually emit data to the consumer and the consumer uh, imported to the external database. So this is what I thought in the, this is something I have in mind so that put something um, something in between because I don't want to put the file read approach in the producer because I don't want to say a man consumer saying, give me more data and then the producer actually go to read a CSV file because um, CSV file could be different uh, in cases. Like I could read any, uh, 10 megabyte CSV file, or I can read a 700 megabyte CSV file. So I want consistency. So the producers should only deal with the pure data. In this case, is the raw uh, rows of the CSV. So I that's why I'm thinking putting the CSV uh, file reader here, and then passing the row to the pub sub. And the CSV row, it is um, communicate between the jobs and the producer. Why the person? So um, first, let's have a look on the application top level. So in this case, uh, we introduce um, a producer and a consumer so that uh, it is uh, uh, running when the application starts. And then have a look on the on the jobs. So it is still a John, uh, it is still a, a gen server, but now when the job is run, uh, it, it I simulate this to fetching our data. So say um we have job A and B and C. Um job A has like 10 rows of CSV um job B has 20 and job C has 30. And then for each, uh, each, 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 each range that I use the string and then to fetch the actual content. Say, uh, just imagine um, this is actual CSV content row. So uh, the job A, it return eight, one, two, three, and then B for four, five, six, and C for seven, eight, nine. So for this one, these two is, uh, these two line actually simulate um, I'm reading a huge file from, from, from a CSV file. But because we are using our scheme, then um, then we can like, reduce the memory and do some uh, lazy loading. And we have this one, uh, chunk area, um, chunk size, for example, versus have two. So that means is if we want to import CSV, um, say this CSV has like uh, uh, 100,000 lines, and we don't want to insert the row uh, one by one because that would take too many database connections. And instead, uh, we have using simple chunk array. So we can chunk um, every 100 lines, and then we, we, we can bulk insert the, the uh, 100 lines in the database. So, so I use the chunk array. In production, I will use like something like 100. So we, I insert, uh, we, we uh, insert, um, we import 100 lines every time. So, and then the last one is uh, interesting here. It's like, I'm going to broadcast these rows. So here, uh, because 
back then I have only experienced with PubSub, Phoenix PubSub, so I just use it. So, um, so I publish the public jobs and give it a job name. And then we have the chunk data and publish to the uh, PubSub. So um, if I have a look on the producer, so um, very simple. Oh. So by starting the producer, I actually subscribe to the PubSub under the jobs. And this is just some um, standard uh, uh, handle command. Say the, the middle one here is the the the, the data that you emit to the to the downstream processes. So when when PubSub receive data, and then it will trigger the handle info info function. Then we have a job name and the actual data for event. So when this receive, I will emit uh, the producer will emit the event, and then to the downstream consumer. The consumer itself is uh, very simple. So I uh, went up uh, upon start. It subscribe to the producer, and when I have event received uh, for the purpose of this one is like um, I take like fifteen minutes seconds to insert in the database, and then after like I'm are processing this data and and our return value. So the gem manager itself doesn't change anything. Uh, the 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 change part is between the the jobs and also add two component of uh, producer and consumer. So okay. So it's the same. So we have all these supervision, supervision tree set up. Then we do them. Oh, let's, let's for this one. So um, probably need to. Oh, what I'm doing. So you can see um, I have um, the data already published and consumed by the consumer. If I can uh, scroll down. See, um, I'm starting job A, job B, and job C, and then from the job, which is this one. So when the job actually um get run, eventually it will uh broadcast the data in Buxa. In um also because I use the chunk query, so you can see um this is the job name, and the data clearly is actually contain of uh two rows only. In, in, in production, it could be like 100 rows for this one. So, so the same thing for, for AirPath. So regardless, um, you can see job B fail, but you can see job A broadcast, job C broadcast, um, job Job B doesn't get chance to broadcast, but um, the consumer pick up and then see process job A, job A, and and job C. So that that means um, we have control on how many um, workers on the consumer side uh, to process this, other than uh, putting everything in one go and then crash the database, and then we have control of um, we actually separate the process from the, the stage that producing the data and the stage that process the data. So let's do another experiment. Like if we have 10,000, 2,000, 3,000. So, so you can see if I keep adding uh, data, um, it will still um, like handle it um, nicely. So uh, in production, there's another issue I, 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 I will say for the later. So in this case, 
I can stop it now. Um, that means uh, the, the consumer can handle this one. Um, the other thing is we can control the number of the consumer. Say you're saying um, using only one consumer to process the import data is too slow, right? My database connection is at least I handle three or four. So in that case, um, we can actually increase the, the consumer number. So you can define your, as long as ID is different, you can define two consumer. So when you do the job, you can see the process ID of consumer is, um, now I have two to nine and two to eight. So we have two consumer that process the data at the same time from the first stop. So um, that means um, for, for my case, um, I can use this one to control, um, hopefully I, in, in, in real production, I, I need to like do some testing and see, see how many actually consumer uh, hit the sweet spot. But that means I have control of um, how the downstream, the, the, the capacity to, to handle the, the volume. Okay. Um, let I just say, are you, why, why I use Parkson? It is because I didn't read the document carefully uh, because the gen state documentation, if it, if it converted into PDF, it is like 70 pages. Um, actually, it is already have built in functionality for module buffering. So uh, we just need to have uh, uh, different dispatches. So it is called a uh, broadcast dispatcher. So it's something like um, when the, when the consumer is up, like, like when, when, when the system is spin up and then the consumer already subscribed to the, uh, the producer. But back then, because the corn jobs doesn't kick in and then um, the producer doesn't have any jobs for the consumer. So that um, in, in that case, once it returns zero, uh, I have no jobs and the consumer won't ask again. So that would be an issue in our case. Uh, but uh, for this one, um, the gen stage has uh, dispatches for broadcast. That means the producer, when you receive events, you can broadcast the, the data to the, consu uh, to the consumer. So um, this is uh, some, some long reading that uh, if anyone is interested. So let's have a look. So for this one, um, first up is gone. So um, the job start run. Before here, it is published to the pixel, but now um, it's using something else. So we get the pixel. So let's have a look on the producer. So actually, the change is very simple. So um, pretty much just change up this line. So we change this dispatcher to broadcast dispatcher. And when the job reading for and then um, streaming the data, um, you can directly streaming to the producer. This is the uh, data tuple that gets sent to the producer. And then this get received on the producer. And for this one, it means um, whatever I receive, I emit to the, emit to the consumer right away. So there's no change on the consumer itself. So this is just a simple tweak um, on the produ producer, but we already can get rid of parcel. So it was fine, right? So, so even I have more, more jobs, So everything is fine. Even I, I publish my like, button job like every 
every second or three thousand for every second. So it actually continues the process. So um, the same goes for error uh, error path because it, 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 it would be it would behave the same as last approach. So only only uh, drop B is got fail and drop A and C. If I, I keep I keep running the two drop command and uh, it, it, it just it just handling uh, happily. So the next one is um, uh, enhancement. Um, this is these two examples actually in the official document. So we use the uh, broadcast dispatcher with the queue, uh, which is the earlier module. Um, it, it is sort of a, a message queue, but um, it is shared with uh, first in first out. So that actually makes sense. Um, so we have the data that push to the queue and then uh, come up from it uh, and then uh, the and produce uh, to the to the producer. So the good the, the thing good thing about it is um if uh, for the previous approach if somehow um the consumer dies and then the data uh that already sent to the consumer will be gone. So there's no way that um you know that um which event has been processed or not. So it, it will be the similar, similar, similar structure. So before, so in the producer, uh, instead of hooks up, um, it will have a when we receive events, it will create the events internally inside the producer, and then um, when consumer query, and then it will emit events. When the connection was established between consumer and producer. And it doesn't have any say that it subscribe to the cons, uh, produce, producer, but have don't have any event. But that that is not a problem because um, with the broadcast dispatcher, the producer can um, can can emit the events only when it receives data. So yeah. So this is my last line. So um, the only change is uh, when handle the event, the insert the line here, saying using the Erlang image uh, module, so that um, we receive the events from the caller and then put into the state, and then it dispatch events. So well, in short, this two block it means um, if the if the produce if the Producer have have data coming in, then it will store in the queue before uh before the producer is ready uh before the consumer is ready. When consumer is ready and ask for the, ask for the, uh, ask for data, then it will dispatch whatever um data already in its state and plus the one that it received from the from from, from the caller. So oh, it's pretty much the same. Um, so I guess um, it is it's better in terms of my error handling. Um, just another one I want to share before. Okay. I try to reproduce an error that I saw in production. Yeah. So um, if I produce events more often, like so in a in a structured time, then I have the issue of just state producer as this task one event from the buffer. Well, in, in production, this this number is scary. So I try to figure out what happened. Um, um, after long reading, actually, actually until very recently, then I realized um, there's a, a conflict in the producer. So here we have the we can have an option for this structure, but we also have a, a 
Ah, acá. We have a buffer size because um, the default buffer for producer is uh, 10,000. So in this case, if I like at each trigger, if I trigger 6,000 x 6,000 um, events, uh, if I if I click it uh, quick enough, then it has to re exit the buffer of the producer, then we raise this error. Uh, not error, uh, raise this warning. But that is bad because that means uh, you, you discuss it, the data that you don't know of which one, which one you discuss, which one, you, which one it doesn't. So this very small config that have a pretty, pretty big impact in production. I only found out very recently. Um, Oh, I wish I can uh, fix that before, <laughs> beforehand. Um, yeah, so this is something that I want to add uh, in real life, in real life production issue. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, summary. Um, so by revising this uh this this uh this project that I actually I actually learned a lot about how the the gen server and uh, the and the gen stage work. And um it is very powerful too, um, but may require a little bit of learning curve, especially when you try to debug it in the production. Um, but I have, uh, but I always have confidence in the Elixir's performance. Uh, it, when we when we complete correctly, it is very powerful. Um, if you guys are interested, I, I I would suggest that um there's other libraries and more uh, frameworks that is worth to have a look. Uh, the other uh, one is Broadway, which is uh probably is very popular now. It's temporary multi stage. Um, data in ingression. I think this is something building on top of gen stage, if I remember correctly. Um, but it is like more production rented like to deal with the AWS and uh, Q and Kafka so that it's easy to integrate with the real world project. And the other one is commanded, which is a uh, 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 very good uh, CQIS email sourcing framework. Which I I really hope I have a chance to 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 just try to in, in at some stage. Um, so some of this talk and the demo it is uh, inspired by the book um concurrent data processing in Lisa. Um, yeah, it's a very good one. I I still need to dive into it to learn. So that one if you're interested. So sorry for my <laughs> long long talk and my language. Um, yeah, so that's my talk. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very uh, much, Wei. I think you did fantastic. Does anyone have any questions for Wei? I wish I understood Elixir enough to have some. <laughs> Wait, is your is your code available somewhere, like on your GitHub profile? Uh, yeah, uh, GitHub? I, I will. I will push the demo um, um, tonight. Sweet. Uh, yeah, feel free to tweet that out. Then when you're done, and we'll we'll re we'll we will retweet it. Cool. Um, I did have one question. So uh, these these jobs that like failed, you're saying they failed because the schema had kind of changed and it needed uh, code change to handle it is that right yes yeah so how how did you deal with sort of retrying those was there any mechanism to sort of just hold them in place uh, until the code was updated or uh, let me see that was right there for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh sorry right. so if they're going back here um for the supervisor here because super, supervisors supervise jobs right so currently we have uh, several um, restart policy. Uh, for this particular demo, I just use temporary. That means um, if you fail, um, then uh, 
say that up to an algorithm like three times or five times, and then it, it won't try to restart because the up to a point they understand that no matter how many times you, you try, you still fail, right? Um, there's other uh, always like always, regardless if you fail, if you keep restarting. Uh, uh, but in my case, if they change schema, that that mean, doesn't mean that no matter how many times you, you try, you still fail. So so in my demo, I just use temporary, so it's just it's easier to demo um in, in, in the console output. Um, in in real life, uh, when when the schema change, I have to manually uh, change the uh, the job types. Like 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 mm -hmm. uh, uh, here, because mm -hmm. um each job types are ma matched to a database schema for that particular table for that CSV. Um, yeah. So, so would you would you just like roll out the changes and then just wait for the next night's cron job or something? Oh, uh, no, it's like I have uh insert the uh, error notification like entry. So if I detect uh, schema change, it will broadcast to um, Sentry for data ag aggregation. So that is kind of manual process. So when mm -hmm. my colleague complained to me, ah, oh, why this doesn't like update it? And then I just have a look, oh, okay, Sentry is saying, okay, this, this, this particular uh, uh, job type has, has added a new column. Uh, in, in, a, in a Sentry, we would say uh, column ABC is missing. Then I know that, okay, I need to add this, add, add, add this, add this to the schema. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Cool. So, anyone else got any questions for Wei? Yeah, Wei. Um, yeah, that was a fantastic talk. I'm. I apologize for. Uh, I turned up late. Um, but uh, yeah, there was a lot in there. So that was good. Thank you. Um, my question is about. Um, uh, you've. You've um, gone from a bounded queue size to an, un an unbounded queue size there um, because you're getting too many jobs. Um, is there any instrumentation uh, that you can put in to make sure that going to an infinitely sized queue doesn't blow up your, your whole service running out of RAM or, or, or whatever? Because it's kind of, I guess the reason there's the default in there um is to protect you from those kinds of cases yeah well well um from the last example um this example using the dispatch with the queue is actually from the official document but um i guess it's always have a risk if we put everything into one node right um I, the, the approach i would do is uh from the very beginning of the data the data fetching even before the came into the gen state process, um, you will avoid loading too much data into the memory. So that's why I'm using Steam. So regardless how large the CSV file is, I can only uh, submit a small chunk of data into the producer. Um, that is yeah. the first one. Um, and then when I receive data in the producer, um, I have the, uh, you can specify in the buffer size. Um, to be honest, uh, in production, I'm not sure how it will go for if I define this indefinite, um, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, but to be honest, like if, if I would do things that are more complicated, then I probably will replace this one to some external queue, like, like rapid end queue or something, so that it doesn't, the queue in the memory, uh, the memory in the queue, it is like maybe in, in, an, in another node or in, in, uh, in another service. So it have an extra layer of buffering. Um, but, but for the demo, it's like, um, this is like sufficient enough that we have the queue within the same processes. To be honest, like this approach is having like raw in production. So, so this is my um, like proof of concept to, to, to improve the project because um, although this is not implemented yet in production, but uh, the issue I encounter, it is, uh, it, it, is it is real. So I, I have to I face the, the same issue that, that, um, that this demo demonstrates. So that's why I'm trying to visit and 
see if I have have a better solution and do this uh, proof proof of concept stuff. But um, like I'm sure when I put it back to production, I probably have like different issues, uh, new new challenges. I would say. Um, but for that, I I, I have not too many information for now. But I would say um, if there's a risk to um, exposing your memory in a single node, then that I would say probably you put it in a, a, a proper um, queue, external queue, so that it can handle um, like properly. Okay. Um, uh, answer your question. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that's my. It was a very leading question on my behalf because, yes, I mean, it's pretty obvious that infinite buffer sizes have risk, and yeah, there are to, uh, various mitigations uh, there. But um, yeah, thank you. I did have a another question, if uh, that's okay. Um, you mentioned commanded. Um, do you have any? Um, any sort of uh, thoughts as to how you might uh, is that is that to for this job processing type work or for for other for other mm, things? No, um, yeah, I'll be honest. Like I only read very briefly on commanded. I I, I have some friend that um, use it. Um, and, um they, they, their feedback is very good. Um, but for this particular um, like the demo, like like my, my CSV job, um, uh, it doesn't like. I don't think it fit into that category of use case or commanded, but um, I, I see a um, lot of um, uh, Rails process are more, more, more and more moved to the um, event sourcing stage. They have their own um, Ruby version of uh, event sourcing library. Um, uh, I, I keen to know about, um, but for commanded, I, I really want to like, if I, if I have a chance at work, to, to use it, then I'm really looking forward to, to, to try it out. Uh, for now, I don't have like, too much experience for this one, to be honest. No, that's fair enough, because yes, um, I, I've used Commanded, and at, at, at the moment, um, I am working on something that's you know kind of like a job processing um, uh, feature for an app that has Commanded in it, and it's, um, it's an interesting combination if you yeah if we didn't already have commanded uh, i wouldn't necessarily use it it's a bit of it's overkill um for this kind of uh, this kind of thing yeah uh, things like broadway and uh you know uh, other things that are already out there i think are um are fine but yeah maybe you knew something i didn't so but that's all good thank you thanks for that thank you